Welcome to Team Talk. I'm delighted to have uh, Simon uh, Harmer with me this, this morning. Um, he's an agency founder that, in his words, he told me this earlier, has never really had a job. Um, but he has managed, this is why he's here today, to, to lead and create an award-winning design studio called Thursday. So today, welcome. First of all, welcome, Simon. It's great to have Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Great, great to, be, great to be here. Thank um, you. We're going to look behind the scenes at design. We're not actually interested in the design or all your awards uh, today. That speaks for, for, it, for itself. And anyone who wants to know about that can easily look you up on, online. You're very easy to find. Um, but it's really about the people behind it, because I, I believe they're pivotal to the, the success. Um, and let's, 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 let's share with people some of your you know, leadership insights, some of your, some of your mistakes because they're great mm -hmm. that people can can learn from. If you don't mind sharing, that would be fan fantastic. And advice on leading people and team, particularly within the creative sector. Um, and apologies if it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but sometimes creative people are hard to hard to, to manage and, and lead. Um, so let, let's let's just start with the the story. So we met yonks ago. Um, yeah, you had a teeny little business called marmalade on toast that's right i distinctly remember meeting you kind of in a pub and i also remember you with this little notebook doing 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 sketches and yes. now we're at this point so just just <laughs> just talk talk people through the through the journey because i think it's going to add quite a lot of context um to the to the the, the tips we're going to you're going to provide yeah i mean i've still got my notebook with sketches in if that's any use to you i still <laughs> that's that's still something I do on a daily basis. Yeah. So um, I guess I, well, I've always been a creative by trade. I um, trained as an illustrator. I, in fact, I'm still a published illustrator now. Um, I kind of do it in my very limited spare time. So that's the craft that I still maintain. Um, I left university. Oh my gosh, 25 years ago, probably. Um, and at the time, I was sharing a flat with my housemate, and he said. Uh, um, what are you going to do next? And I said, oh, I don't know, go and work in the pub or whatever. And he said, look, he was the kind of gift to the gab guy. He said, listen, uh, I'm going to turn you into a famous artist. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, you know, didn't think anything else about it. Next day, literally, he came back in and went, right, the guys next door, they run a construction company and they need a logo. So um, let's, let's do them a logo. So um, I sat down at my uh, desk with some pens and paper and I drew a logo, uh, took it down to the copy shop, printed up some business cards and letterheads and, um, uh, and we got paid like 250 quid. And I was thinking, I was convinced we couldn't make any money doing this. And that's literally how we started. Um, we went to the bank, they gave us a loan to buy a computer. I taught myself all the packages, uh, and Christian, my business partner, would go out. This was in Portsmouth where we went to university and he would go and see small businesses and say that, you know, we can do these designs for you. And that's how we started. We did stationery, flyers for pubs, hairdressers, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, back in 19, I believe that was 1998. So that's how we started. Yeah. Um, we then were on a TV show um, in 2000, 2001 it aired. So an amazing guy who I'm still friends with. I went to see him in New York earlier this year, a guy called Alvin Hall. Okay. Um, he's pretty well known. So he used to do a show called Your Money or Your Life. And he would go and yeah. sit with yeah. individuals yeah. and figure out their finances. And they wanted to do a show on um, kind of students and startups. So they did a show on me and Christian. And we did this TV show, which was quite eye opening. And not long after that, we got a bit of funding. Uh, we then moved the business to Winchester because we wanted to be closer to London. And between you and me, uh, Winchester is a slightly nicer place to live than Portsmouth, um, as much as I love Portsmouth. And um, yeah, we set up um, the agency from there. So yeah, that, that and, and Christian actually exited the business six years ago, uh, moved back to Northern Ireland with his wife. Uh, so for the last six years, it's been just me as the, as the kind of founder and a, a kind of organically grown a, a team of up to about 20 now. Um, <laughs> And part of that growth was an acquisition as well. So we acquired a, a smaller agency locally, brought them into the team, moved into this big, beautiful studio here in 2009. And then we rebranded. We changed the name. 
um, the original name we came up with, the marmalade on toast one that you mentioned, we literally just sat in a room one day and went, what are we going to call this thing? <laughs> and that's what we came up with. This time we did it properly. Um, we've done it so many times for our clients. We thought, let's go through the same process for ourselves. We actually used a consultant because we were a bit too close to it. And as part of that, we renamed. Um, and, uh, and the name, as so many people ask me, comes from the fact that our process here Thursday is insight led. So we're all about getting back to the foundation of what a problem is. You know, why do you need, think you need a rebrand? Why do you need to design and build a new website or a digital experience? Um, and we ask lots of questions and try and get back to the core of what that is. And um, so we went all the way back to our beginning and we were born on Thursday, the 10th of January, 2008. Quite, quite a journey. It is, <laughs> yes. So t t tell us a bit about the, because you bought another company, which uh, that, that comes with people and often that's kind of two cultures coming together. What, what, yep. was that, what can people learn from that experience? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. So we had a good look around. We realized that, um, you know, I'd always had ambitions for growth, not stratospheric growth. I don't have any ambition to build a 40, 50 staff agency. Um, so we're we're now at the sort of, you know, 20% year on year growth. Um, so we were very careful about looking around. Um, it, it was an opportunity that came to me via somebody I knew. So I already had a connection there. And when I met the MD, I just knew straight away that he was so like me um, that I knew that his team would yeah. be receptive to somebody else coming in. And it was a little bit difficult to start with. I think they were quite um, worried um, and a little bit sort of nervous. Uh, but once we started to talk and I reassured them that, you know, that their, their jobs were safe, we wanted them to carry on and work for us. And that it was more that we were taking over from the former MD. Um, and then when they met our team as well, they all came together in the studio. It was just, it was just brilliant. And, that, and that's a massive thing. Um, I think if you're thinking about acquisitions, it's very, well, I'd say it's very, it's relatively easy to go out and find people that want to sell the business. Um, yeah. What you need to do is make sure there's a culture fit. And if that doesn't work, and I've heard of other agencies doing something saying it really doesn't work and it is very, very difficult. So, yeah, that's yeah. a really important thing for me. And culture is really important to me. And that, as well as culture fit, because... You obviously established kind of rapport and you knew that team. You So you knew it was going to work. But I think there's, there was, there's something important because people are still often anxious of, of change or some people are. You've got different personality types. So, you know, it sounds like you you would you address that well within the within that new team, giving people the reassurance that they need, all those kind of things. Is there anything else that you you want, that you did to make that transition work well for the people? Yeah, there's two things, really. And I think this is true of everything when it comes to people. There's the practical side of things. So, look, your contract's going to stay as it is. You know, you, you've got all of these things. You'll keep those. Um, you're going to keep doing the same job. You're going to still keep working with the same clients. We're not going to radically change all of that stuff. OK, so that's that's the kind of practical, if you like, left brain type stuff. Then yeah. you've got the right brain stuff, which is all around culture, personality and people. Mm. So I sat down with each individually and I said, look, this is what's happening. You tell me what, what you want to get out of this. Here's where we're going as an agency. Um, and we want to take you guys along with us. If, if you're excited about that, then we'd love to have you on board. And once you know what people want uh, and where they want to go personally, hopefully it's aligned with you. And if it isn't, it isn't. That's fine. I've had conversations in the past with people. And I do say this to people quite genuinely. If you want to come and work here, but then you decide actually in the future, you want to go off and start your own agency. Well, I'll help you do that. Because ultimately, yeah. it's going to benefit me in the long run. Um, I'll, I'll get the best out of you for a few years. We're both open and honest with each other. And then you, you'll go off and do something amazing, which for me is a massive success. Um, you know, we talk about, you and I were discussing this earlier on, on our website, we talk about meaningful change. Well, that works from a client point of view, but it, it works from a people point of view as well. It's important for me that my team are growing and that they, they, they kind of have this meaningful change in their lives. And if I can do anything to empower that, then amazing. So I think those two, the balance of those two things is really important. I love it. So a really clear vision. But and again, you personally spending time and really getting a little bit under skin of what motivates that, those individuals. Yeah, absolutely. And, and 
we were talking about this the other day, one of my uh, team, and I guess testament to how strong the culture is a bit of a cliched word, but it's a good word, right? Um, to how strong that is, we had a designer um, called Paul, who's probably one of the best designers I've ever worked with. And he came to us from university and we could yes. see he was talented. Um, we took one look at his portfolio and thought this stood out. So we hired him. He was probably really early on, like one of our first hires. And I remember speaking to him and saying, what do you want? He said, look, you know, at some point I really want to go and work in London. I really love London. I feel like I want to go and work in one of these big agencies. And after about five, six years, he came to me and he went, it's that time. I've been offered a job um, for a big design studio in London. And I said, go and do it. I, you know, I hope it goes brilliantly. This is kind of, you know, we always knew this was going to happen. And, you know, I'm sad to see you go, but I said, that door's always open. And um, two weeks later, I was sitting with the creative director and he put his phone up and said, Paul wants to come back. <laughs> and um, I remember really clearly, because one of the things we do here is we have um, a quarterly meeting. So I get right. the whole team together. Uh, we'll either do it here, well, particularly now we've got this lovely space. But at the time we were doing it in a, in, in a room above a beautiful pub. So I had this big space and I said, look, it's really sad that we've lost probably our best designer, but I've got some good news for you. We've got a new guy coming in today and he's here today. And there was a knock on the door and the door opened and Paul walked in and everyone burst into tears. So anyway, so it was a lovely moment for me that you can kind of let people go and, you know, if it's strong enough, they'll come back. Love it. A bit interest, interesting, lovely story. What, what was it that made him come back? Because you must have something great going on there for that to, that to happen. What else do you think drew yeah, him back? That was, funny enough, James, that was the first question I asked him. I said, why? And he said, you know what? He said, I love the work. I love the scale. And it was a big agency. We're talking, you know, maybe 200 staff agency. He said, but I'd lost the kind of um, the warmth and the feel. And, and, and I think the, the feeling that he was having big impact. So he was a small cog in a big wheel, whereas yeah. here he's a, he's a big cog in a small wheel. Um, and that's something I try and give to a lot of my team. It's this idea that they can make, make a big difference. Um, you know, as I say to clients all the time, actually, particularly in, you know, new business meetings, I say, look, we're, we're big enough to take on large scale projects. We're currently rebranding a global energy company, but we're small enough that you'll always get to deal with the client service director. You'll always get to deal with the creative director or our technical director. And I'm always around, you know, I don't disappear. Um, and people can escalate things to me very quickly. So it's that nice size of big enough to to cope, but small yeah. enough to care. And is, there, is there anything that you would do differently now in hindsight, uh, either as, I guess, part of that merger, would you have done, or bar, buying, sorry, would you do, any, would you do anything differently? Uh, with the merger, I would say it, it, it probably went as well as it could. Um, we, you know, in 20 years, we've had so many ups and downs, you know, the, the amount of kind of, in fact, I did a talk in London last week and I was talking, what we, we're, we're doing a white paper at the moment, it's called The Age of Change. This idea that there's so much, particularly the last five, 10 years, you know, yeah. there's so much happening that we have no control over. Um, and there've been so many ups and downs. Um, I know that actually not long after we bought that agency, two of their biggest clients um, effectively disappeared, not because of the merger, but one of them got bought by their American rivals and right. they, they in-housed everything. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and one, um, one went through a global rebrand and half of the marketing team left and they were all of our contacts. So we literally lost two biggest clients for no reason. Um, and, and to be honest, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, I'd say in terms of, mistakes which i've made a lot of as you said earlier i've never had a real job right i started straight from university <laughs> your words simon yeah exactly <laughs> exactly I, that's what i say all the time i've never had a proper job um, yeah. um and what i mean by that is i've never worked in a, in, a, in a big corporation or a company but you know i've got lots of clients that i work with so um we made lots of mistakes particularly early on because we just didn't know what we we're doing and we had to learn on the fly you know it's, there's a i think it's reed hoffman who's got a lovely expression which is you jump off a cliff and build the plane as you're falling down. That was kind of how we were. Um, and it was scrappy and, you know, there was lots of things that we did wrong, which in hindsight we'd have changed. I think from now, the things that I would change, 
occasionally it's around people you, you're right to say you know for me this is a people business um and the quality of the people that you surround yourself with is so important um there's a great quote about you are the average of the five people you spend most time with and Absolutely. you know these people here right now is hands down the best team i've ever had I know that I can be out of the business, you know, I'm going away for a half term for a week. And aside from, you know, any major things that happen, you know, the client services is going to run brilliantly because our client services director is exceptional. All of the creative is brilliant. The technical team have managed really well. And we've got a good ops team, a finance manager in place. So everything works really well. So we've made some mistakes in the past around hiring. Uh, and, and then that you, you can quickly see when that doesn't work. So I guess from a mistakes point of view, sometimes it's that. And the other thing probably is around clients. Um, we now have a pretty stringent qualifying process with clients. And again, to that kind of left brain, right brain thing, one of them is a numerical, literally tick box. Have you got all of this information? And that's around budget, time scales, agree, oh, yeah. competition. You know, do we know anybody into those kind of things? And then you've got the kind of gut feel stuff. And that's around, are we going to get on with these people? Is there a fit? And the key thing always is, is, do they trust us? Is there mutual trust that they come to us? We're hands down, the best work we ever do is when people say, you, we trust you to make the right decisions. Here's what we understand and know about the brief on our business. You're the experts from a creative and digital point of view. Um, so in the past, we've made some mistakes, but you know, it's like with, with sales, you, you know, something comes in and you go, yeah. It's money, brilliant. It's a project, yeah. particularly in this business where it's, you know, we're quite project led. And you, from a salesman's point of view, you, you want to grab hold of everything. And I think one of the things I've really learned is just to take a breath, uh, consider it really carefully um, because we have had, and not many in the last 15, 16 years, but the odd one where you just said, Do you know what, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have taken that project on. And how the trust is an absolute fundamental of teams i love how you've used it to to pick the clients that you work with as well is there anything that you do beyond instinct that that enables you to do that because probably people can actually take something from what you do even for use within their own team yeah so um we did when we did our rebrand, part of the work that we did is we, we asked a, an external consultant to do some research. So I had come up with this idea a few years ago, and I think this is a really interesting thing for people to try. So where I'd got to, and as a business, we, 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 I guess from a service point of view, most of our work is either brand or digital. So we create beautiful brands, we reposition people, we do naming, creative, visual, verbal yeah. identity, all that sort of stuff. On the digital side, we design and build lots of apps and uh, websites from e-commerce right the way through to, you know, kind of uh, digital experiences at events. Um, and I guess one of the things that we thought about was because we work across lots of sectors. So we have broad services, broad sectors, which isn't easy from a sales and marketing point of view. And I remember thinking, rather than going out and trying to find more healthcare companies or more tech companies or more property brands to work with. It struck me one day that all of our best work comes from people. So I said, instead of trying to go and find another Samsung or instead of trying to go and find another NHS or another boat folk who's one of our leisure clients, yeah. why don't we go and find another Dom? Let's go and find another Eliza. Let's go and find another Jenny because these are the people where we no, do I our best work. So yeah. instead of looking for companies, we looked for people. So we created personas. So the research company yeah. went off and spoke to these people. And they spoke to clients where things had gone well, clients where things hadn't gone well, um, clients that decided not to work with us. And we kind of built up these personas. And then we said, right, these are the two personas that work really well for us. So now when I'm in a meeting, I'm sitting there and I can tell almost instantly, this is one of our personas. Actually, this isn't one of our personas. Uh, because the flip side is we know people where it doesn't work well. So now we've built okay. up. So it's it's a mixture of what we've built up from a persona point of view and the gut feel in the room. So almost just because you've defined what good looks like and what obviously isn't good, you know, probably instantly you sit down with them, you can in your head work out where they sit. 
Exactly. And not just me, because it's throughout the agency, other people, you know, because client services will say, oh, we've just been introduced to somebody else or uh, in the business or oh, X has introduced us to somebody else. And the other thing is, as you know well, that um, like attracts like. So we know that if a Jenny or Eliza recommends us, generally that person's going to be very like them. So yeah. it t- tends to work really well. And then you get that network effect. Fantastic. And is there anything else that you do to really build and enhance the trust internally? Uh, do you mean with my team or team, do you mean yeah. building trust with clients? Yeah, with I mean, team. yeah, I, I've always maintained from an early stage that if your people are happy, they'll do great work. Um, and so within reason, we try and um, we try and put them first. We try and make everything as easy as possible, but also as flexible as possible. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of things. So everybody gets their birthday off. Um, um, we, we, we created this amazing studio space for the people. Um, it's, a, it's a very cliche thing from an agency point of view. There's a ping pong room at the back. It's got a dartboard in it. But you know what? It's used a lot and people yeah. love it. Um, you know, there's a brilliant coffee machine with the best coffee that we can buy. There's free parking spaces downstairs. I let people come and use the space when they want to. Um, I'm really flexible with working hours. If you need to come in at nine o'clock and leave at three to go and pick your kids up from school, I don't care. Um, I've got three kids, family is super important to me. Um, so anything where anybody has to go, look, I've got to go, I've got a problem with this, or then there's been a problem. Just go and deal with that first. Uh, and I know that you'll give me the time back. Um, so what I've seen over the years is when you do that to people, Without asking for it, they will give you everything back in spades. So I know that I'll come in the next day and they'll say, oh, thanks for letting me go. I worked last night on X, Y, and Z. And I didn't ask them to do that. They did it because they care um, yeah. and they're reciprocating my sort of care for them, really. And it's interesting, yeah, because you've, <laughs> you've touched upon the uh, the cliche. I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to bring it up anyway of, of the, the table football or the, the table, table tennis table kind of in an agency and I guess from an outside outside world other leaders might see that and then try and replicate it now it's easy if you've got a little bit of space and a few quid to replicate putting that in what I guess is fundamental is the things that you do alongside that isn't it and they might be tiny insignificant things sometimes beneath the surface and they're not visible to other people what is what is really important because it's it's not the it's not the it's not the table that creates that culture, is it? No, you're absolutely right, James. Um, so the culture has been created and crafted over years, and I've I've said this before to other people. You can't um, you can't just say right, we're going to have a great culture. You've got to build that culture and build that trust over time, and that comes from action. So again, similarly to that kind of left brain, right brain thing, there are certain things that are written down and in contracts so you get your birthday off um everybody has private health care um we we do regular kind of um events so we'll do we'll go out for drinks we'll do um last year we took everybody paddle boarding down in and pool for the day so we'll do things like that which build culture then it's about getting the right people in the room and actually they start to build the culture for you so we know we, we you know we have this thing where we say are they a thursday person or, or, you know, we'll meet somebody and go, oh, they're really Thursday. And you know then straight away that they'll fit in. And when that happens and you build a, people, build a group of people together who are like-minded, who have similar interests, um, who care about the work in the same way, then it just builds exponentially. And they kind of do it themselves. And there's some amazing relationships that build up that you would never think would happen. You say, oh, yeah, me and such and such went out over the weekend or we did a bike ride together or, you know, we're going paddle boarding or skateboarding next week. And it just builds organically. So it's bringing the right people together, giving them the flexibility to do the things that they feel are important, and then just building an environment around that they feel happy and safe in and giving them good work to do. I don't want to take anything away from that amazing environment that you created, but I'm just going to play devil's advocate for a moment. Mm -hmm. It all sounds really idyllic, doesn't it? So there must be moments where people clash or have, have, disagreements or you've oh got... yeah yeah how does that how does that play out 
Um, well, I suppose it, having built up a, a team of people who, who intrinsically get on, and this is a real cliche, but it, it's very much like a family and you will fall out, right? You'll fall out with your siblings but you, and you know that you're going to have an argument about something. Typically, that might be around, um, you know, a work or a project. Or, you know, I need this. OK, well, I'm working on this. And there can be a little bit of tension. I actually think that's really healthy to yeah. have tension every now and then because it sort of pushes people and drives people. When it gets to be a problem is when people really fall out and really clash. It doesn't happen often because we've built a group of people who get on and understand each other. It's generally a kind of reactive thing of there'll be a clash and they'll go away. And very rarely will it need an intervention from me or one of the leadership team. Uh, they all manage their teams individually. So they're very good at managing those things. And either there needs to be then an intervention. We had one, um, I think it was last year with somebody in the team that just needed to be managed. And, and eventually they decided that this role wasn't right for them. And that worked out well, but we did it in a way that was, you know, we didn't just kick them out. We talked to them, we went through the process and, uh, and, it, and it, it works itself out well in the end. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a case of being patient, trusting people to kind of manage themselves to some extent uh, and then relying on the leadership team as well. And, you know, we have an external HR, HR person as well if we need to escalate things up. But, I, you know, I, you love never... the... Sorry, go on. I love the family scenario that you've that you've painted there because what it you know yeah, yeah of course you have arguments and and the heated moments in any situation um but what it suggests to me is that you've gone a level up from your kind of baseline trust sort of you know as, as a british nation we're all very polite aren't we yes um, but it, i think it's you're a level up as a team if you can get to that position of you know Positive conflict. Yeah, often, yeah, it's a great expression. Often, yeah. often called, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good expression. Um, and I think as well, I suppose for me, I've always done this, and I've always had had this team, and I've always cared about the people here a lot. And I sort of forget what it's like. As I said, you know, I've never had a real job. I sort of forget what it's like outside. And sometimes, obviously, I go into lots of businesses and clients and speak to people, and I sort of sort of see it. But there are moments where people internally just say to me i don't think you realize how good we have it here or how great it is to work and those are just the moments where i think wow that's amazing and not because i've gone out of my way to say this has to be an amazing place to work it's just sort of natural it's just what i've done yes. and it seems to work so we keep doing it um and the people around the leadership team do the same that's why you're here so you can share a few tips of, of, of wisdom so, <laughs> let's uh Let's let's look at that because it sounds like your team have quite a lot of autonomy and get on and deliver stuff and manage their people them, themselves. Um, how did you how did you find that journey? Was it difficult letting go? What was your because that that is yeah. a lot of people have a difficulty letting go and they never get to where you are now. Did you go through that? Yeah, that's a great question, James. Um, so interestingly, I do a monthly leadership. Uh, call with BEMA, the British Interactive Media Association, which I host. So loads of agency leaders come together and we get on a round table and we talk about all the hot topics of the day. Yeah. And we did it yesterday. And it will be, you know, you get the guys who are just starting up, like two, three man bands, right up to the big network agencies. Um, and really interestingly, you can tell that with the agencies are at a kind of five, six, seven, eight, nine scale where they're like, that the biggest problem they have is they're still involved in every aspect of the business and they're trying to do two things they're trying to find their right position and they're trying to pull themselves out of all of the different things because you can't do it all absolutely um I, to some extent i was lucky luck is an interesting thing we could talk about that another time um <laughs> i had a business partner so we had two distinct roles he was always the sales guy and i was kind of the creative leading the team internally right as we as we grew organically um we got up to kind of seven eight nine ten maybe twelve people um my role became a bit more sales led. So I started looking at some clients and things like that. So throughout that journey, I've done pretty much every aspect of running the business. Um, I, you know, I do get involved in the finance, which I, you have to understand that stuff as a business owner, even if you're not super technically minded or super financially minded. I spend a lot of time with my finance manager 
and our accountant, partly because it's just important. So there's a the finance side of thing. There's the operational side of running a business and what that means. Um, the, the project side is really interesting to me. So the actual running of the work, that was probably the worst thing I ever did, right? Being a project manager, trying to manage projects, just not my, I, I am yeah. not that way inclined. Um, Ellie, who's our project manager now, is the best project manager I've ever seen. Just, just you know, spreadsheets, everything organized to the nth degree. Um, account management, I like. I like spending time with clients, that stuff. I, I miss the creative. That's why I'm still an illustrator, but I spend a lot of time with my creative director and I, you know, I don't get involved in the creative aspects of the job, but I like to see how things are going. So whilst I've done all of those things, I know what my skill set is and I know where I can add value. So now I'll step out. There's no point of me running a project or getting involved in the details of a project because I'm just not good at it yeah. and I'll get in the way. Um, I can read a spreadsheet or a, you know, a profit and loss account, but I don't need to do all of the details for it. So uh, to begin with, it was quite hard to sort of try and let go of those, some of those things, but it comes down to people. And, and once you surround yourself with brilliant people, you just stand back and let them do their thing. And now my focus is on leading the SLT, the leadership team, setting the vision for the business and going out and meeting new people and, and winning new clients. And once you've got that defined, it's an absolute joy. You know, like I said earlier, I, I can... I can step out of the business for a week and go on holiday and I'm not on the phone every day. But did, did you know that at the time? So did you deliberately think, okay, well, if I was to broadly summarise it, I need somebody who's got, for example, better skills in project project management and that I trust. So I'll go out and find that person or did it? A bit, a bit of both. So partly it was it just evolved naturally. Look, we've got all of these projects. We can't manage them ourselves. We need a project manager. Partly it's outside consultancy as well, saying, look, a structure of your size, you should have these people in place. So it's kind of outside. We've had um, outside uh, uh, consultants work with us for uh, a few years, which is okay. great. So you kind of lean into that experience because, you know, agencies, agencies always think that they're unique. They're really not. You know, we all do similar things. We run projects in similar ways. Um, it ultimately comes down to the quality of the work of people, your culture and your process. Um, so, yeah, partly it was because out of necessity, we need a person to do this. And partly it just kind of happened organically. Yeah. Excellent. And did you find that you've completely let go now? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is my baby. Uh, this is my fourth child. Um, <laughs> actually, my oldest child, I guess. Um, actually, second child. My 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 daughter turns eighteen this year, so she's a little bit older because uh, Thursday was born on yeah two thousand and eight. Um, so sorry, I've totally forgotten the question now. Going on to kids, it was it was about the, whether you'd completely let whether you'd completely oh, let let, let no. go. What we're really after here is you know because you're you're obviously you're, you're coming across you've developed your your agent, but it's there's still thoughts in your in your head, aren't there? So how do you how do you cope? What advice can you give to your, other people going through this journey of, of 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 leading their ship and having to let go so all it comes back to is you know the simon Sinek thing is is what's your why right so what what's yeah. your purpose what are you starting with where are you going so for me i've always had this ambition to build an agency of a certain scale with a certain number of people and then I knew that that would open up lots of possibilities for everybody in the agency. Uh, for me, I, at some point, I'm not ready yet. I might just take a back seat. And, you know, there's probably going to be a point where we bring on somebody to do the new business. And then I'm kind of just leading the leadership team and just making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, so, you know, I could step down to two or three days a week or something like that. I don't envisage a time when I won't be involved because I love it and I love the people. Um, but I, yeah. I want to kind of get to a point where things are working really smooth. So there's always little things that can be changed. Um, so I don't feel like I'm ready to sort of let go completely. Um, so it's kind of understanding what that end goal is. You know, for some people, they want to they want an exit. For some people, they want to, you know, want their team to take over. And it's like succession planning. I, I guess it depends what type of business you're in as well. Um so start with that, start with your why, what it is you're trying to get Absolutely. to, and then work back. Yeah. You know, you've got to start with the end in mind um, and yeah. go back that, from that's, there. That's really easy because if you do know where you're going, it's very simple to ask yourself as a leader a simple question along mm. the lines, um, 
am I accelerating us getting to this vision or am I slowing us down? Perfect. And a really good friend of mine, um, I'll name him actually, a guy called Adam Thomas. Uh, in fact, he's, I do football coaching and him and I coach my eldest daughter's football team. I said, he's the, he's the manager. I just turn up and move the cones around. Okay. And we had this brilliant conversation once. He used to be a runner when he was younger. And he was talking about the Olympic running team. And they had this thing and they, from day one before, you know, whatever it was, two years out from the Olympics, they were, right, everything was geared up to them winning gold. Yeah. So everything that they did was geared up around, does it make the boat go faster? And that's a phrase I use a lot now, which is like. Yeah, I love, I love it too. That, it's a, it's a yeah, great story. That's where yeah. you're going. Yeah. And if you, and if, if anything that you're doing doesn't make the boat go faster, forget it. And he was yeah. like, well, we, well, what color trainers we're going to make? It doesn't matter. You know, uh, but you know, what, what, what make other outfits? Well, yeah, that might make the boat go a bit faster if we can wear slightly, you know, what are we going to do with the seats? Yeah, that could make the boat go faster, you know, all these little things. And I think it was the, um, the cycling team where they just said, look, 1%, we just change everything by 1%. If we can go a little bit faster, a little bit better, a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I when think you that, get into high performance thing. teams, which clearly those are both great examples of, then all of these tiny incremental gains are the difference between, you know, being on a podium and not. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Now you did it. You did a TED talk about going beyond that. How do you help your people, your teams go beyond? Oh uh, yeah. Good question. Yeah. That was a slightly terrifying experience a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, but I loved it, but it was, uh, yeah, it was hard work. Uh, so look, I think it's back to what we talked about earlier. It's this trust thing. So I, I, I believe that, you know, everybody's got the capability to go beyond, which is what I talked about in that message. And what, how that manifests is, is different for different people. Um, but I will always give people the opportunity to do whatever they can. So if they want to go off and do a training course, if they want to go off and, you know, go to South by Southwest for a week and learn things, then, yeah. you know, if we can make it happen, we will. Um, you know, we've got budget set aside for training. We've got budget set aside for sales and marketing. So if we can do things within, again, it's about making the boat go faster, right? If your people are going beyond, then your agency is going to go beyond. You know, if, they're, if they have a drive to be exceptional at what they do, then the agency as a whole, yes, you know, that cliche of the a rising tide gathers all boats or whatever it is. But, you know, yeah. we'll, 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 we'll all benefit from that. So it's about them understanding that they can do it. Um, and knowing that we'll do what we can to help them get there. Ooh, good. And in terms of just going back to the agency world, because one of the I've worked with loads of different agencies across my 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 time, including including design, which I know is your special speciality. And I think one of the things there are many, but one of the things that makes them stand out is their ability to sort of dig beyond the brief. And yeah, clearly we're still talking about teams and people here um the, the question is kind of what what do you what do you do in that regard that probably helps you dig deeper and understand your your people a bit better uh, so i think from a, from a project and a process point of view it's, it's back to that kind of left brain right brain thing right design is this kind of and creativity particularly is this kind of crazy mass of ideas and stuff like that so to, to make that work you need really strong process to underpin it. Yeah. Um, and so we have a kind of a double diamond process, which was uh, designed by the design council, I think back in the early 2000s. Uh, so first phase is all about understanding. And so when we get a brief, we will have lots of questions. We'll speak to our clients deeply, uh, and then we'll understand as much as we can about their world, their audiences, their competitors, the marketplace as a whole, you know, what their objectives are as a business, back to that thing of, you know, what your why is, where you're trying to get to. Um, uh, we'll ask lots of questions, interviews, surveys, go and speak to people, all of that stuff. You build up this massive amount of knowledge. And actually what we like to do is try and challenge a brief because quite often briefs will have uh, preconceptions in them. And if we can challenge them, I think that's healthy. Yep. Um, and so we, 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 we teach our people here what that process is. And it's really simple to understand. It works cross brand and digital. And they intrinsically then know it. So they'll get a brief and they'll say, well, hang on a minute. There's, where's the audience? Or, you know, who are your competitors? And they'll start asking the questions. It's all about asking the right questions, which helps you really 
get to the bottom of something quite often you'll find these little nuggets which you didn't think and that's that's the kind of magic source really so even yeah. before you get to the creative or you know digital prototypes or wireframes you want that kind of magic thing in there uh, which just helps you to differentiate that company or that brand or that experience I think some people do that really naturally um, yeah. because um, you could you could apply what you've just described to to teams and getting to know people because mm -hmm. there's a load of questions that go deeper than most people do and then there's a degree of positive positive challenge now I expect you all do that naturally because it's a business process that you live and breathe by in your work but somebody else could take what you do for briefing and understanding a client and put it into their 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 people enhancing process to get get to know each other better and challenge things openly for the for the right reason yeah absolutely i don't see why not i mean i've had this conversation before with people that we because of the nature of what we do and how we work we quite often unearth things that we weren't expecting um and i think about a project that we did with a company years ago and it was a branding project. And as we went through and we did these kind of journey maps, and you know, let's take the journey map is literally here's your customer, yeah. customer X. Let's go through the entire journey and all the touch points that they go through and how they think and how do they feel and what do they say through that process. And every time we did it, the same thing kept came, coming back, which was brilliant products, uh, the delivery is fantastic, everything else. There was this bit in the middle where the account management stuff really wasn't working. Well, we didn't hear from them for weeks. Or we didn't get the quotation properly. When it came through, it was a bit messed up. And we suddenly un understood that actually this was a people problem, that they didn't have a strong account management team in-house. Now, it wasn't our job to go out and find those people, yeah. but having unearthed that problem for the company, they could then go out and solve that problem. So yeah, that a process and a design, if you like, can really help to unearth problems or insights that you might not find um, from a people point of view, not just a kind of creative point of view. But an apology is in advance for this question, because it's a bit of a cliche. And I, the, the, the diversity of, of people is something that I really, you know, strongly support. But from a managing creative people, there is sometimes a you know a, a cliche maybe it's a myth that, that that's really awkward or, or difficult what advice would you give someone outside of the agency world where they have to manage somebody who's a bit more creative yeah it's a, it can be a bit like herding cats i suppose uh, what's interesting <laughs> about our agency is that we we have we've, we've got a really interesting mix of people who are quite a quite diverse so we're a pretty good split male female um and age-wise, I think our, our youngest is early 20s, our oldest is in his 60s. Um, and so we, there's lots of different people, but you'll find that, for example, the, the, the development team were always really interesting to me. So the cliche of developers is, you know, they've, they've got the glasses on, they're pale skinned, they sit in the corner with their headphones on and in the dark coding away. But well, actually our technical director is a, is a superb photographer and videographer, very creative in his own right. One of our latest developers, Dave, He's a brilliant artist and he does graffiti and all this kind of stuff. So uh, John, one of our other developers, trained as a designer first, then got into it. So they're all quite creative in their own right. They're, uh, lots of yeah. people do kind of stuff in, their, in, their, in the background. Now, the key to managing creative people is, well, firstly, it's the trust thing. Um, and, and secondly, it's just you come coming back to kind of, from a project point of view, it's coming back to the brief and that discovery piece and understanding all of that insight. That the creative team won't start looking at stuff until they're clear about what the brief is. And so that's a really good anchor point that you can keep coming back to. And yes, sometimes you need to, there's a bit of ego management going on, but it, it just comes down to getting the right people. If people are always very, very kind of, you know, and I, I get it, you know, I, I do illustration work in my spare time. Some people come back to me, oh, I'm not really sure about that. And I'm like, Ooh, you can't help but feel like people are critiquing your work. But actually, the joy that you get when you get it right sort of makes up for it. So you've got to understand that it's yeah. part of the creative process and they have to understand that. Um, so it's about getting the right people, coming back to process um, and just giving them that trust and that flexibility. Excellent. I love how you've answered that because it's a it's kind of an unfair question in in a way, but actually it, it you've 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 gone beyond the 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 obvious because yeah, there's all of your people have got unique unique qualities. So yeah, you've just you know uh, 
cliches are, you know, almost to be ignored to some degree, aren't they? Yeah, 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 so yeah that, absolutely. That individual and their strengths and their purposes and communicate exactly. with them in a, in a great way. So, you know, yeah, thank you for answering that one in a really, really positive way. No, you're welcome. Very, very quickly, if there was one bit of advice you were to give to your 10, 10-year-old 10 younger version of yourself, uh, what would it be? Ooh, 10, 10, years, 10 years ago. 10 years uh, ago. Wow, 40. Um, so it's a couple of things. I, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I actually think mistakes are really healthy. I've, I've talked about this a lot. You know, I, I'm, again, it's a, it's a bit of a, an exaggeration. But, you know, if, if Fleming hadn't accidentally left, left his uh, Petri dishes out over the weekend, he wouldn't have discovered penicillin and saved millions yeah. of people. There's loads of stories about people making mistakes that end up being brilliant. You learn from mistakes, right? So Absolutely. I'd, say, I'd say to my kids, don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, go and do those mistakes. You'll learn from them. You'll be stronger. So I don't, I kind of thought back of all the things that I've done over the years and I wouldn't be here now if I hadn't done all of those things. I guess the two things that stick in my mind from a business point of view are surround yourself with the best people. You know, the mistakes yep. I've made tend to be around clients or slightly wrong hires here and there, which has sort of stopped making the boat go faster. And the second thing is, um, it's, it, it's, it's kind of rigor around things like sales are so important for a business, right? You, you could have the best process in the world with the best creative team and, you know, amazing people and all the trust and the culture in the world. If you don't have leads and work coming through the door, you don't have a business. Mm. Um, and it took me a while to really kind of switch that on for me, particularly when my business partner left because he was a sales guy and I had to really teach myself to go out and do that more. Um, but you've got to nail that as quickly as possible, the kind of sales and marketing thing. You want a consistent source of reliable leads coming into your business to, to keep it surviving, really, and hire ahead of the sales. So don't go, right, we need 20 people because I think I'm going to win all this work. Win the work first, then go and get the people. Yeah, cool. Finally, what would you, what would you recommend? Is there, any, is there any great reads that you've, that you've read over, over the years that have helped you that you'd recommend to others? Yeah, loads. Uh, so, uh, leaders are readers. Yeah, I truly believe that. Um, so I think one of my favorite authors from a business point of view is Jim Collins. Yeah. I, I just love his rigor and his attention to detail. So, you know, he'll write a book that he spent 10 years researching. It's all backed up by phenomenal research. And I love frameworks. You've seen my TED talk, it, yeah. you know, I read, and it's the it's that kind of creative thing of you know got all these ideas running up. Well, let's funnel them into a framework that works. And Jim Collins has some brilliant training. He's got the hedgehog concept. He's got the flywheel. I love that, and his writing is brilliant. It's really easy to read. So I love him. Uh, Greg McEwen is good. Essentialism. I love that kind of stripping the stuff away. Uh, there's a guy called Richard. I never know how to pronounce his surname without sounding rude. K O C H. I've heard it pronounced Koch. I've heard it pronounced Koch. <laughs> anyway. It's a, the 80-20 principle, Pareto's yeah. law. Yeah. Oh, I love that because, it again, it's a good read, but you can really apply it. So I, I love books that you can apply to your business. And, you know, I use the 80-20 principle. We'll get to the end of the year and go, right, generally speaking, 20% of our clients have generated 80% of our revenue. It's never exactly right. And then you, you, you then go, right, okay, what do we do with those 20%? Well, you nurture them. You know, go and spend time with them, do more with them. The 80%, are there people that, could be moved up into that 20 percent yeah or are there people that you just need to let you know just tick away in the background you know my experience is sometimes it's the smaller clients that take up so much time and actually what you're better off doing is saying and we've done this in the past where you just say i'm really sorry i, I think we're just not right for you at this point or you know um this is our new pricing model and if it doesn't fit then yeah you know we'll go and recommend them to other people but it works. You've got to make it work for both parties. And so I, I really yeah. love things like that. So, yeah. And this, exactly the same thing applies to applies to teams. I'm not talking about your team, team here, but often Agreed. people will spend 80% of their time with the people who are causing trouble and issues and therefore ignoring the people who are going to lead the business, ready for the next yep. promotion. And you know, it's easy to imagine what might happen in that scenario. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Simon, real pleasure to have you on. Thank you for being so open about your 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 experience. I'm sure others will will benefit from uh, from that. You're welcome. It's been it's been great. What a great way to end the week. Thanks thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Lovely. Thank you.